Hey, good morning. And as Brandon said, it, it, it is Memorial Day weekend, and uh, it's so humbling to be uh, in, a, in a place like our country where we do get to enjoy the freedom to worship freely. And our tendency is to, to go back into more recent history, uh, probably because there's people that we know or, or experiences that we've had, uh, when we think about Memorial Day. We think about uh, the most recent conflicts we've had. We go back to Vietnam or World War II, Korea. Um, but there were conflicts before that as well. There was World War I and, and, and the Civil War and, and, and on and on and on back and, and, and even to the Revolution. And then you go back even further in human history and there's even more conflict. And it's one of those things that the more you look at it, and as much as we, we, we want to honor those who have chosen to sacrifice for for things like freedom, a good thing. Sometimes wars and conflict was fought over things that weren't so good. Sometimes conflict uh, rose out of the desire for conquest and for possession. Sometimes conflict rose uh, from imperialism. Sometimes conflict arose out of so disgusting a thing as, as genocide. And so when we, when we remember today it's important also to note that, that the world we live in is, is not harmonious. It's full of discord. And it's, and it's unfortunately always been that way since after the garden, right? And, and we don't have to look at the news. We don't have to go uh, to international politics to see the discord. You maybe are having discord with somebody this morning. You may have woken up next to them. They may have had breakfast with you today. Or it's somebody that, that you work with. Or it's somebody that you used to share a house with, but you don't anymore because you've moved out or because the relationship fell apart. Discord is, is a part of our, our, our lives and, and almost one of the skills that we have to have is how do we navigate discord, right? And so today that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about discord. This is the last of our sermons on real life. And we're going to be in Psalm 41, Psalm 41. And I want us to see how in the world do we find harmony in a world full of discord. And the first thing we need to acknowledge is not by starting with discord, but starting with harmony. Harmony is happiness. Harmony is happiness. Verse 1, chapter 41, to the choir master, a Psalm of David, blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. So something you may not know about the Psalms, the Psalms are divided into five books. There are five books within the, the 150 Psalms. And the first book is Psalm 1 through Psalm 41. So today we're in the last Psalm of the first book. And what's interesting about this is the first, uh, the, sorry, this, this Psalm 41 begins with the word blessed, which pretty much means happy, happy. It's the same idea that Jesus talks about when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the, the pure in heart. They will see God. It's this idea, in Greek, it's makarios, it's this happiness, Happy is the person who does this. And what's interesting is that verse 1, or sorry, sorry, chapter 41, Psalm 41, is also, since it starts with blessed, Psalm 1 also starts with the word blessed. And so one commentator talked about the fact that you could look at these first 41 Psalms and you could see how to live a happy life. How do we live a blessed life? How do we live a happy life? And I don't know about you, but that sounds really great. That might be a good reason to show up to church if they're going to tell me how to live a happy life. I'm in. And it checks out. Psalm 2 talks about how happy a person is who finds their refuge in God. Then we get into the 30s, and every single one in the 30s, it seems like, talks about it. Psalm 31 talks about how happy a person is that survives a war. Psalm 32 says a person is happy if the Lord forgives them. 33 talks about how happy a nation is when they follow God. 34 again brings up the idea of finding refuge in God and how happy we are. And Psalm 40 says, you'll be happy if you make God your trust. And what each of these have in common 
is that the happiness is derived from some kind of harmony. It comes from some kind of harmony. Finding refuge in God, finding trust in God, that's harmony with God. When I find my trust in God, I, I'm, I'm harmonious with him, right? When I find my forgiveness from God, that's a restored harmony from him. When, when the person survives a war, he's celebrating the harmony that he finds by, being, uh, by, by strife being gone away, discord's gone, and peace has returned. The nation, when everybody's following the Lord, the harmony that they're finding is everybody pursuing the same end, a common goal. All of this derives from harmony or restored harmony. And all of us will agree, harmony usually leads to happiness. How happy are you when everybody in your house is getting along? Probably means there's not a lot of people in your house. But it's nice, right? It's nice when everybody gets along. And these first three verses are dripping with happiness, right? It kind of communicates this life that we all expect from religion. Look at the things that are offered. The Lord delivers us. The Lord protects us, keeps us alive. We're blessed. He doesn't give us over to the things that, that try to hurt us. We don't get sick. And if we do get sick, God's going to restore us to health. That sounds like a really great thing. That sounds like happiness. That sounds like what happiness should be. It kind of seems like God has this armful of blessings that he has, that, that we have access to. And the way we get access to them, it tells us in verse one, blessed is the one who considers the poor. Great. So there's this exchange rate between God's blessings and me. If I am a good person, I can have access to God's blessings. And the better I am as a person, the more likely I am to get those blessings from God. And other religions seem to back this up. Islam says, whoever feeds someone who is hungry will have their sins forgiven. That's restored harmony based on that exchange. Sounds a lot like this verse. Hinduism, practicing virtues like charity, allows for self-cleansing, the removal of bad karma. I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of that. There we go. Liberation from, from the cycle of reincarnation and death is found in being charitable. Zoroastrianism, which you did not think you were going to hear about today, but you are, talks about being rewarded and punished for the good and the ill that you do in this life. And charity is one of those things. And it sounds like the Bible is joining in in this chorus of exchange between us and God. The more we do for others, the better a person we are, the more harmony there will be, the happier we will be, and the blessings will pour from, forth from God. And we kind of instinctively get behind this. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that when I do good things for people in a lower economic position or a low, lower social position than I am, harmony is produced they are better able to overcome the challenges that they have, and I feel better about myself. I feel good. Or when I freely give of my own volition, allowing somebody else to choose what movie we're gonna watch, what meal we're gonna eat, when I allow somebody who has their turn signal on to get into the lane in front of me, if you don't have your turn signal on, you get no help. <laughs> there is rules and etiquette, and I am there. God has put me on this earth to enforce said rules. And some of us think that way. Harmony is produced. Everybody's happy. We get to work. I'm just a car length behind this other person. It's not a race. If you live in Texas long enough, you know it's a race everywhere. And this is what we expect from religion. We expect God's word to give us little ideas, little suggestions, little, little motivations Towards what? How do we have access to those blessings? How do we get those things that God has? What do we do? What are ideas so that we can produce harmony and happiness in the world? So what's the problem? What's the problem? Sounds great, Travis. Let's go home. Well, there's a big problem. And it's the presence of discord. The problem is us. 
Let's talk about discord. And let's talk about how discord is destructive. Discord is destructive. David moves from these first three verses that are kind of abstract. They're kind of, kind of high, pie in the sky kind of thoughts. And he moves to reality. We crash back to reality with David. And here David's talking about something else entirely. David's talking about discord. His life is not happy. Things aren't going smoothly. There's not harmony in David's life. And what I want us to do is I want us to look at these verses and I want us to see the ways that discord is created. This isn't all of the ways, but these are some of the ways. And the first one, we need to look in the mirror. Selfishness leads to discord. Look at verse four. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me for I have sinned against you. The essential problem with harmony is ourselves. We can't be selfless long enough to a great enough degree that'll actually promote long-term harmony in the world. This is what David says when he confesses it. He confesses to God, oh God, be gracious to me for I have sinned against you. He's recognizing his culpability in the disruption of harmony in the world. Whatever situation he's going on in, he's saying, hey, it's partially my fault. It's on me. There's a brokenness inside each of us. There's some inside me. That leads us to be insecure, mistrusting, selfish. It puts my own personal harmony, my own happiness above other people's, over happiness with God. And so I won't be selfless. I won't let the person out into, the, into traffic. I won't let the other person choose a meal because I really just don't like that kind of food. And what's interesting is I, I, I won't, this isn't plotted. This isn't planned. Not all of us, not many of us, hopefully are manipulative like that. Sometimes it comes up at the most random times. How many of you are completely unreasonable when you are hungry? Who are my hangry people? Thank you. Thank you for the honesty. We're gonna talk about integrity later. You all get gold stars. Yeah, there's this thing called hanger, right? It's, it's a true thing. You joke about it, but it's true. In the 40s, in 1944 and 45, Minnesota, a Minnesota group of scientists did a study on starvation and hunger. And they took 30 or so men. By the way, uh, about 28 of them were uh, from Christian denominations. Basically, the idea was to get good-natured people that have been taught to think for others, charity, and they'd proceeded to deprive them of food. And you know what happened? Well, you know what happened. They became depressed. They became anxious. They became antisocial, isolationistic. And the only thing they could think about was food. The only thing they could think about was their hunger, that gnawing hunger. How can the harmony of the world rest upon people whose whims are so governed by whether or not they get a square meal every four to six hours. It's impossible. It's impossible. Or if we're sleep deprived. And you know what the even greater problem than that is? We don't just hunger for food, y'all. We hunger for prestige. We hunger for accolades. Accolades, I don't know why I said it that way. We hunger for... for uh, material possessions. We hunger for relationships. Even when we have more relationships than we know what to do with, we still want more, 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 more. We have a hunger. And it shouldn't be a big surprise that the first sin happened around hunger. It says that Eve saw the fruit and saw what about it, that it was good for eating. And so she ate and she gave some to her husband, and he ate. We hunger, and it drives our selfishness. It drives our desires. And we'll all sit here and cognitively live in this cognitive dissonance where we'll say, yes, society is better and happier and, and more harmonious when we're selfless, but then we'll make exceptions for ourselves, right? We'll say, it is good for everybody to obey the traffic laws unless I have a dentist appointment that I've known about for six months. I've had six months to get to this dentist appointment, but I've waited until the last minute. I'm gonna be late and they are going to charge me $100. So there is no red light. There's no speed limit. There is only avoiding the late fee. Or we'll say things like, it's good. 
when we all go to church. It's good for society that we should all go to church. Unless, you know, Jimmy has a baseball game and he is a mediocre athlete at best, but it is still really important that we go and take Jimmy to his baseball game. And you know what happens with that? You know what you're teaching your kids? The worst thing isn't that you're teaching them that sports is more important than their relationship with God. That's not even it. You're teaching them that they can use their brains to decide when God is important and when he is not. And so what they're gonna do is when they're older, they're gonna start identifying things that they find more important than the Lord. And you're gonna wonder, what happened? We raised them going to church. No, you raised them. You raised them to make a value judgment. And when following the Lord loses out, we wonder why they don't go to church. Or we say, oh, society's better when we're faithful to our spouses. But Travis, you don't understand. My marriage has been stagnant for years and you don't know the kind of person I live with. And this other person, they are giving me a lot of attention. It's really nice. We make exceptions. We make exceptions. And all of this contributes to discord and it's destructive. It's our selfish nature. Can't avoid it. It does damage to society, does damage to our marriages, does damage to our friendships and ourselves. But it's not the only thing that creates discord. Discord is also created by apathy. Apathy leads to discord. Look at verse five. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? Apathy negatively affects the world around us in ways that we don't consider. You know why we don't consider them? Because we're apathetic. We don't care enough to think about how it affects it. This is the major conversation right now in, in, in race relations, in immigration. I know that, that there's a lot of stuff thrown around about who's a racist and this person's all that stuff. And the argument around it isn't necessarily that people are actively doing things that are, are, are racist. The conversation is that many of us are apathetic about what happens to people who don't look like us. And that's the problem. We're apathetic. We don't care. And I know we wouldn't say that. We, we don't like to admit that we don't care about something. And it's impossible to care about everything. I get that. But do you care about something about which you have no vested interest? Do you care about anything that you don't have an investment in. Because if you don't, it might be time to ask yourself, am I apathetic? And does my apathy contribute to discord? Because if we're not careful, the sentiment that David says in verse five, my enemy save me in malice, when will he die and his name perish, could be labeled about us in our regard to other people. When will they die and leave us alone? It's not just apathy. Sometimes we go on the active pursuit of creating discord and we use our words. Not a big surprise there. Words create discord. Look at verse six. And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words. And while his heart gathers iniquity, when he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. David shows that the impact that words can have on other people. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt me. You know what's not true about that? I have long since healed from the sticks and stones that were thrown at me. But there are things that, that have been said to me that I still carry with me. It's not true. I wonder who wrote that. Who said that? Just lived in silence? Words are destructive. When we're hypocritical, of other people, or sorry, hypocritical ourselves. When we present one face to the world around us with our words, but secretly inside or secretly with other people, we're different. That creates discord. That's disjointed. It's a lack of integrity. Or what happens when, when we speak and we say things that, that, that are, are selfish, verbally being negative, Right? Verse 8 talks about negativity. Let me ask you this. How many of my people, we'll have a moment of honesty here, second chance for you people that, that missed the first chance. How many of you when, you, uh, when you go to buy a product on Amazon and you go to look at the reviews, who are my people that skip the five-star reviews right away and go right to the one-stars? Come on. 
Yeah, yeah. We started a club in the first hour called the One Star Group. I'll give you an invite because uh, I'm definitely one of those people as well. I, I take distinct pleasure when a movie bombs. Um, I don't know why, but I'm like, oh, that movie's terrible. And they thought it was going to be good. I don't know why, but we live in a very critical society. And we enjoy reading the one star reviews and the bad movie reviews. And there's something about it. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, maybe it's my own insecure nature. But we're critical people. We pour forth negativity with our words, and that contributes to discord. And then there's anger. There's anger. When we say things out of anger, it contributes to a great deal of discord. Ambrose Bierce said this, the writer from the 1800s, speak when you are angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. It's wise words, wise words. But an older writer named James had this to say about speech. He says in chapter three, verse six of a letter that he wrote, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Our words matter. Our tongue is set on fire. And that fire often rages out of control and we don't guard our tongue. And all of this creates discord and all of it creates disharmony with other people. And so it destroys happiness. So the question now becomes, well, Travis, how do we get back to harmony? How do we make things happy? And there's a problem with that question. And the problem is this. There is so much discord that you can't skip over it and then jump back to harmony and happiness. There's too much baggage. There's too many wounds. There's too many scars. You got to heal first. There's got to be healing. So let's talk about how unity is healing. Unity is healing. Verse 9, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. David does the only thing he's got left to do. He appeals to God for help. He appeals to God for help. He says, God, you see what's going on here. You see how things are going so badly. Please help me. He says, get me up out of this sick bed. Raise me up so I can repay my enemies in some way. I can defend myself. Set me in your presence forever. Give me harmony and peace with you and give me harmony and peace with others. And you might say, well, Travis, how is this any different than what we talked about in the first part? It's vastly different because look who he's counting on for harmony. Look what it says in verse 10. He says, but you, O Lord, be gracious to me. He's not relying on himself for harmony. He's recognizing his part in the disharmony. He's recognizing that he needs help. He's recognizing that he's broken. He's recognizing the needs that he has. He's saying, I can't do this. I can't make harmony and happiness here. I need you, Lord God. And notice he talks about his integrity. Well, Travis, isn't that a conflict? Doesn't, isn't talking about your integrity, isn't that being like a holy and righteous person? In some senses, yes. But in this instance, integrity before God is not holiness and righteousness. Integrity before God is honesty. Integrity before God is, or before anybody is honesty. And so David is being honest before God. He's like, I can't do this. And so when we go to God and we tell him, Lord, I have contributed to disharmony. I've been selfish. I've been apathetic. I've been critical. I've been angry. I can't heal the wounds that I've inflicted. I can't heal the wounds that have been inflicted on me. That's integrity. That's honesty. When we go before the Lord and we're like, well, God, I've tried. I've done everything I can to heal these relationships. And I've, I've forgiven and I've done this. I, 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 I. That is not integrity. That is not integrity. You are depending on yourself for harmony and there will be no healing that comes from that. 
None. Harmony is not something you can attain in yourself, in your relationships with other people, apart from God. He is the only one who can heal those wounds. And I'll tell you why. But we need to look back at the passage. And I've said this a number of times. These Psalms are not about you. And they're not about me. Our tendency is to read the Psalms and be like, oh, this is exactly how I'm feeling. They're not about you. It's okay to use them to express yourself to God. I'm not saying that. But we need to remember the, the, the protagonist of the Psalms is not you, it's not me, and it's not David. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that these songs are about. Look what it says. Verse nine, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Jesus, at the Last Supper, says somebody's gonna betray me. And they say, who? He says, the one that dips his food, his bread, into the cup with me. And it's Judas. This lifting of the heel could be a reference back to Genesis 3. The prophecy about the Messiah where it says the, the, the serp, the, uh, Satan will strike the Messiah's heel, but he's going to crush his head. Look at verse 9, even my close, sorry, in verse 10. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He was resurrected, but he was raised to life. We talked about this at Easter. All the courts said that he was guilty. But God says not guilty, why? Because of his integrity. You see, Jesus is the only one who can stand before the Father and say, I was never apathetic. I was never selfish. I never said anything in, 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 in anger out of selfishness. I was righteous. And God says, you were, you were raised. Death is overturned. So why would Jesus do this? Why does he go through all of this? Well, it tells us in verse one, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. Y'all, we are the poor. We are the poor. Because all we have is discord and disharmony. And despite our desire and our recognition of the need for harmony and happiness in the world, we can't make it happen. We are impoverished. And Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one who has done enough to access the blessings of God. They're all his. And you know what he says? He says, I'm gonna consider the poor. And he invites us to have a part of his inheritance with him. And when you put your faith in him, when you trust him and say, God, whatever blessings God has for me, they're only attainable through Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in him rather than faith in yourself, you're united to him by faith. And that is how we find healing. Healing comes through unity with Christ, unity together with him. And that leads to unity with other people. Ephesians 2 says that he tore down the wall of hostility between people. He himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So now we're able to have peace and harmony with other people. Unity is the way you heal discord. True harmony is a side effect of unity. So what does unity look like? What does it look like? Well, one, it's celebrating the other person. We do this here at church. We got like four different kinds of worship services here on campus. And you know what? We're proud of each of them. They're great services, great opportunities for people to worship the Lord. We celebrate what happens in the sanctuary, in the chapel, in Spanish language that's going to happen right after this. And they celebrate this group, this room. It doesn't have to be uniform. We don't have to have uniformity. You can worship in different ways. When you're in a family that's, uni that, that's unified. Each member does its own thing, but each person celebrates what God is doing in their life. It's also important to be unified around the right things. It doesn't help if you're unified around the wrong things. The thing that we try to unify around here is the idea that we are teaching and leading all generations to love Jesus. All generations. We're a multi-generational church. Praise God for that. Jesus loved the generations. He spends time with kids all the way up through Jesus loved the, generos the generations. Our unity also comes from generosity. Brandon was nice to y'all when he talked about generosity. I'm not going to be. You need to know something about where we're at financially. We're behind. We're behind. And we're behind in such a way that it is impairing our ability to do ministry. Straight up. And I need to ask you this. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Because a unified church recognizes the need and the potential that we have 
God has blessed this church immensely, and we have a great deal of potential that we may not reach for a lack of funds. What are you going to do about it? And the last thing that unity has is each of us recognizes that we are not there yet. We're not there yet. We're still working. We're still trying. But more important than all of that, we are still trusting that the Lord is not finished with us yet. The song we sang, the first one I think we sang today, was he's not done yet. That's having integrity before the Lord. He's still working in me. He's still working in you, which allows us to be gracious. None of us are finished products. It allows me to forgive somebody when they are selfish or apathetic or angry. It is so, so very important that we unify ourselves to Christ in faith. Because here's the thing, uh, tomorrow's Memorial Day where we remember the fallen. But Christ, Christ is the fallen we need to remember because he was raised. And in him we have new life and unity with one another to, to rescue us from our discord. And that one day we might have eternal happiness and harmony with him and with each other and with ourselves. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the way in which you've poured out blessing upon us. It's graciously given, that arm full of blessings that you have, you haven't withheld it, but you've given us both in your son and you've given it just in giving us the breath to be alive. Thank you. May you in your mercy today pour out that grace on people today who need to hear from you, who need a word from you, who are in the midst of discord in their own lives. May people draw close to you and come to know you. May they turn aside from the things that dissuade them. May they turn aside from their idols. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for rescuing us and giving us the harmony, the promise of harmony and healing in you. It's in your name we pray, amen.